you know, I, I have to say, I think one of the features, you know, when we look at uh, sort of today from the future, so to speak, I suspect one of the things where people will say, I can't believe they didn't see that is stuff to do with the, the following kind of thing. So, so, you know, if we describe, oh, I don't know, something like um, heat, for instance, we say, oh, you know, the air in, in here, it's, you know, it's this temperature, this pressure. That's as much as we can say. Otherwise, just a bunch of random molecules bouncing around. People will say, I just can't believe they didn't realize that there was all this detail in how all these molecules were bouncing around and they could make use of that. I mean, actually, I realized there's a thing I realized last week, actually, was, um, was a thing that people say, you know, one of the scenarios for the very long term history of our universe is a so called heat death of the universe, where basically everything just becomes thermodynamically boring. Everything's just this big kind of gas and thermal equilibrium. People say that's a really bad outcome. But actually, it's not a really bad outcome. It's an outcome where there's all this computation going on and all those individual gas molecules are all bouncing around in very complicated ways doing this very elaborate computation. It just happens to be a computation that right now we haven't found ways to understand. We haven't found ways, you know, our brains haven't, you know, and our mathematics and our science and so on, haven't found ways to tell an interesting story so, about that. It that. just looks boring to us. So there's a, there, you're saying there's a, hopeful view of the heat death, quote unquote, of the universe, where there's actual beautiful complexity Absolutely. going on, similar Absolutely. to the kind of complexity we think of that creates rich experience in human life and life on Earth. Yes. So those little molecules interact in complex ways that there could be intelligence in that. There could be absolutely. I mean, this this is the, this is what you wow, learn from that's this principle. Hopeful message, <laughs> right? I mean, this is what you kind of learn from this principle of computational equivalence. Yeah. You learn it's both a a message of of sort of hope and a message of kind of you know there's you're not as special as you think you are, so to speak. I mean, because you know we we imagine that with sort of all the things we do with with human intelligence and all that kind of thing, and all of the stuff we've constructed in science, it's like we're very special, but actually it turns out, well, no, we're not. We're just doing computations like things in nature do computations, like those gas molecules do computations, like the weather does computations. The only, the only thing about the computations that we do that's really special is that we understand what they are, so to speak. In other words, we have a, you know, to us they're special because kind of they're connected to our purposes, our ways of thinking about things and so on. And that's some, um, but so, so that's you know, very human centric. That's we're just attached to this kind of thing. 